This is the 1563 article of faith that we have inherited from the Anglican Church that we still affirm at the core of who we are as Methodists. And what I love about this statement of our understanding of scripture, that it contains all that is necessary for salvation, is the room that it gives us. Because life is hard, and we turn to scripture. But scripture is hard and complicated too. And it gets even harder and more complicated in these later years where we've set up battle lines for how we approach and how we understand scripture. Whether it is the literal word of God and that we need to take every single word as coming from God and being God's will, or whether there's room um, for understanding that there were human authors who were inspired divinely, inspired by God to write, and that there is truth, but that that truth isn't always a word from God that is the will of God, but still truth for us to learn, just learning in the negative instead of in the positive, still truth that is necessary for our salvation. And these are lines that have been drawn for a long time. Back in the 1500s, in 1517, 500 years ago, we have the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther. And at that time, scripture wasn't available to everyone. It was mostly in the Western world in Latin, and most people weren't speaking in Latin anymore. And so there was a priesthood, right, that was in charge over it and in care over it. Um, but what happens when you have the power and others don't? When you know what scriptures say, but others don't, right? You can bend it a little bit. Um, we're human beings. And as much as we pray that prayer, lead me not into temptation, whether we have good intentions or evil intentions, um, whether they are intentions directly for our own self-serving purposes, or we think that we're serving a greater good, there's a lot of temptation there. And so part of what Martin Luther did was say, no, we all need access to the scriptures. When we're trying to figure out how to live our lives, we all need to be able to go directly to God. We need to know, we need to study, we need to have it in our own language so that we have access to this truth. And thanks to the Gutenberg Press being invented and those 95 theses nailed to the church in Wittenberg, we begin this big gift of scripture being made available to all, of all being able to access it for what is necessary for our salvation. But life is tricky. And you know that prayer of, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us? It's really easy, so much easier, to make the person you've nailed those 95 theses against and called them to account for the evil that's been done, it's so much easier to paint all of those people, all of that Catholic Church, as evil and sinful and wrong. And so we're not going to do anything with tradition, with what our forefathers did, with all of the councils that were held to decide what was heretical or what wasn't, what was a faithful application of the scriptures and what wasn't, because the, all of that led to the evil of corruption that we just stood against. And so it's the common phrase of throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's so much easier to do life in black and white it's so much harder to let the wheat and the chaff grow together until God does the sorting. Because it requires so much more of us. It's so much easier to just write people off as all good or all bad. But to give people we hate room to give us gifts that we need and love that we need, to give people that we love room to hurt us and not leave them, that's so much harder. And, and it's a balance that we haven't ever gotten as human beings. And so we have this reformation that we needed. We needed the reproof and the accountability of scripture. We needed our leaders in the Catholic Church to be held accountable for the corruption that was happening. 
but yet we went so far in the 16th century to leave all of tradition, anything seeming of Catholic, that we tipped our ship. And I'm using the image of ship because that was the image, um, that metaphor that was used for the church um, in the early church, that we are the boat, the ecclesia. And so that boat tipped all the way over to one side. And so in the 17th century, we have the Enlightenment coming along. And, and for the first time, literary criticism is brought to scriptures that have been brought to other books, but never to scripture as an attempt to write even out the boat, except what do we do? We go all the way over to the other side again and say, it's all human. There's no divinity involved. And so what do we do? That's absolutely not true. We know all scriptures are inspired God. So we go back to the other side of the boat. And then modernity comes and we have modernism um, that says, no, Jesus was a historical real human being. He wasn't just divine, the son of God. And so we need to come together as a group and decide what we can historically, scientifically prove that Jesus did because he's just a teacher. And then we leave the virgin birth and the resurrection and all that is beyond us, right? And we make faith something that we can control what can fit into our universe and if you were with our kids before they already know that there we have to go through the galaxy to get to heaven to get to god to get beyond right right michaela you got this you can teach this this is not acceptable and so we have the fundamentalist movement that comes and says oh my gosh no all scripture is inerrant it is absolutely all divine um and the virgin birth happened and the resurrection happened. And I believe in all of that, but I do not personally. And, and the United Methodist Church has now had to add to this article of religion and saying that there were human authors. What we haven't been able to do, friends, in the last 500 years is actually find a balanced approach to faith is to actually be able, in John Wesley's words, to unite the two so long disjoint, knowledge and vital piety. We have to have both. We will not be whole without both. Our faith journey will not be whole without both. But 500 years of the boat tilting from side to side to side leaves us nauseous and exhausted. And it takes us deep into the night. So will we be able to find Jesus as our place? Will we be able to find Jesus as the place where both pain and peace can coexist? Will we be able to do both and? I cannot tell you how much I want this for us and how much I believe that Epworth is perfectly poised to be this witness. We are a purple church. We are red politically and we are blue politically. We have people who approach scripture from a literal faith perspective and we have people who approach scripture from more, we're not, don't have anyone that I'm aware of that's totally on the far end of reason, um, but we have some who, who tend and tip that way. We have both and here in our very congregation. So in all my prayers, I feel like the faithful challenge that is before us is can we do what our world has not been able to do? Can we find a way in our church, in our community, for peace and pain to coexist, for purple to be present? Can we find a way to see difference as an opportunity to learn and to grow rather as the opportunity to compete and win over and against each other, tilting the boat and making everyone around us nauseous. Can we be the witness that looks to scripture for all that is necessary for salvation? I want us to do that. But to do that, we have to know which way we approach it scripture being the it, 
We have to know what we mean by salvation, what we're working for. We have to be strong in who we are and what we believe, whether that's in line with the United Methodist Church or not, and be able to say why it's not in line and why at this particular point we choose to take something differently, a different avenue. But above all, we have to be able to communicate. We have to be able to hear each other. We have to be able to want to hear each other. We have to think that somebody has a truth or something that will help us. We have to want the balance and not just the win. And there are people who don't want that. And that's okay, but we gotta name that. We can't pretend we want the balance when all we want is the win. That won't work and that will undermine our work continually and perpetually. I did a double to you know, emphasize the undermining that will always happen. But for salvation, that's something that we're always working on. We had a great conversation on this last Sunday. We have to say the words, right, of belief, of professing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, of knowing that salvation comes through him, but those words alone aren't enough. We have to live them. Jesus is the living word. Jesus is the definitive, unmitigated word of God. And if we are to read all of scripture through Jesus Christ, then we have to read all of our lives through Jesus Christ. That means that profession of faith has to be in every cell and every bone of our body. And it has to shine through, to come through in everything we say and choose not to say, in everything we do and choose not to do, and everyone we befriend and choose to keep a boundary with. It has to be a part of every single aspect of who we are. And that has to keep growing. So it's been my anniversary this week, and I have wedding on my mind, and I've gotten permission from Abraham and from two other newly met, newlyweds, Larry and Madeline, um, in the house to share this analogy of, of salvation. So we have prevenient grace. We have God at work before we even know it. That's God at work to bring about a man born in Peru, raised in South Dakota to DC at the exact same time God brought a girl from Ohio to DC to the exact same live bookstore at the time, right? That's a whole lot of miraculous grace at work before anybody even realizes it in the timing. Larry and Madeline, Larry had been looking for someone for 10 years. Madeline, she was in full businesswoman mode, and she wasn't looking for anyone. She was killing it. She was great. But then this happens. There's, she has a business meeting at the exact same restaurant that she just changed from going to her usual place. The exact same time this guy who has been looking for a partner for 10 years is at. And at that meeting, her business partner is on half an hour late to the meal. And so she's hanging out, trying to wait for this woman to show up. And all of a sudden, there's Larry, and a conversation is struck. This is the miraculousness of God at work to bring about our salvation, to bring about what we need before we even realize it's happening. But then there's a the part where we do realize it, right? And we say that we want it, and that's justification. I have a certificate of marriage. I am officially married. And when we come and have a moment of justification, that is the I believe prayer. That is, I want you, Christ, to be my personal Lord and Savior. I want to make this official. And there are, of course, ceremonies and rituals that go along with this officialness, right? And that can be just in front of a couple people at a courthouse that can be a prayer just by yourself. 
or it can be a whole huge public affair of all the works and all the people out as you make this declaration, or like at a revival where you come forward and you make this prayer in front of an entire community. It doesn't matter how it happens, if it's instantaneous with a big dramatic flair, or if it's something that's grown and realized over a while, it matters that it happens and that there's this moment. But here's what I think the marriage metaphor can teach us. Because I think we get, or at least I get, four years into this thing. This certificate does not mean that all is happy and well at home. It means we've made a promise, that we've made a vow, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're choosing to live from that promise and that vow on this particular day. And the same is true for our declaration of following Christ. And that's what takes us to sanctification. This is something we have to say yes to every day. This is something that we grow in and deepen. My grandfather, as I'm going to tear as I'm hearing him sing Seek Ye First, would look at my parents and tell them, you don't even know what love is yet. And I used to think how silly that was. Because, like, of course they do. I see them. And he's like, mm-mm, Kate, they haven't had grandkids. They don't even know what love is yet. But four years into this, I knew how much I loved Abraham when I stood up and I made those vows. I knew how much I wanted to follow Christ when I prayed that prayer. But I'm only four years into it, and I already know how much more I love Abraham because of what we have been through together and because of the way that we have dealt with it. Because if you have a partner who can take conflict, who can take a crisis, and use it as an opportunity to step further and deeper into the night, further and deeper into risking further and deeper into finding Jesus as your place when all the chips are down and it takes everything you have, that's when your rock is built. That's when your foundation is deepened. That's when you know that you can weather the storms that come. That's when you know that you have a love that isn't just beautiful and bubbly and wonderful, but that will hold you. And that's what I want for us as a church. Friends, I am so tired of going back and forth and choosing nausea over call, over a full sail of wind, over being all of who we are and all of who we are created to be. I want us to be that witness and I think the world desperately needs to be shown that that way is possible. Because we all have dark nights. And we all have crises that shut us down. But to be a place of hope, to be a place that shows us how to hold the pain with the peace, how to hold grief and joy together, that, that is the miracle. That is the good news. And that is the salvation I want to be a part of bringing. And I would love to partner with you all in that work. Amen.